Welcome to TriMet 101. Now today I'm going to be answering a question that some people have asked me before and that is are you going to talk about the West's future or what do you think is the future of West or commuter rail, regional rail, stuff like that. That will be answered in this video. Now I've talked about West before a couple times and my problems with it, my opinions with it, and where I think it could improve. This video is not really going to be that. It, it will, but it's going to be on a much, much larger scale than that. Censored? No. This is a notebook that I have drawn my future of, this is not focusing, of the West, but also of regional rail travel. So there would actually be two different systems. There would be the West providing express service on the West side, hence its name, West. But then there would be trains departing from Union Station in downtown Portland as well. So there would be two, there would be a commuter rail system, the West, and a regional rail system, throughout the area. So I'm going to start by talking about the West. Let's start with the Willamette Line as it should look very familiar. It serves Beaverton Transit Center all the way to Wilsonville just like today's West. But then it drops into Zone 3 and serves Kaiser Transit Center and downtown Salem. This provides a much needed extension into Salem which has been needed for more than a decade now. Now on to sort of an optional one, the Tualatin Valley Line, which, as you would expect, goes along TV Highway, Tualatin Valley Highway, from Beaverton all the way to Forest Grove. Now the reason I say that this one is optional is because while I know it would get used, these are commuter trains, so it would very likely run only during the weekdays at fairly low frequency of probably 30 to 60 minutes. I would rather see FX service get put on TV Highway before we introduce this Tualatin Valley Line, but this Tualatin Valley Line would be very fast to go from Forest Grove to Beaverton. So you could build both, but I definitely, definitely definitely strongly recommend building FX57 way before introducing a second West Line along TV Highway. Now on to the big one, the one that I think a lot of people would use, and that is the Cherry City Line. Now, Portland is the Rose City, so where is the Cherry City? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's our state's capital. Salem is the Cherry City. And this train line travels from Union Station in downtown Portland. That little symbol means that it's supposed to be the Amtrak station. And it goes along the existing Amtrak alignment, but serving a few extra stations in here all the way until Salem. Now, getting outside of the TriMet boundary beyond Oregon City is where it changes into Zone 2, and then when you get into Salem, it goes into Zone 3. I will explain that in a little bit better detail of why I chose what I did for that. But there you go. It would be an all-day train service to Salem. Now this is a regional rail line. It's not part of the West. It's just a rail line. It would have lots of coaches hooked together and would be similar service to Amtrak, but it wouldn't be Amtrak. If you're only going to be taking a more local train from Portland to Salem, you probably don't need business class or a dining car or stuff like that. You just want to take the train. If you want to get an idea of what this would look like, watch my video of where I took the Sounder train out of Seattle's King Street Station and took it to Tacoma. Amtrak serves that route as well, but there is a commuter rail service placed on top of there during weekday commuting times that makes it much easier to travel around these cities and is much cheaper even if it stops a lot more often and has a much worse schedule. However, my Cherry City line and in fact all of my regional rail lines 
would travel all day long and seven days a week. Next up is the Astoria line. I've heard from multiple people that, wow, it would be really nice if I could take a train from Portland to the coast. That way I could go to the beach. Here's how you do that. There's a freight right-of-way that already exists that goes by St. Helens Road and goes all the way up and in through a forest and serves a few areas including Scapoose and St. Helens and eventually goes all the way out to Astoria and the tracks do continue down the coastline so if you wanted to serve other cities you could but I would say at first at least serving Astoria would make a lot of sense and Astoria would be located in Zone 3 because it's really far away and other cities west of St. Helens would be in Zone 2 because they're also quite far and outside of TriMet's boundaries. Now for one that I think is a bit interesting and I think would be temporary, but that is the Vancouver Shuttle. There are a lot of people who live in Vancouver and work in Portland or vice versa and they all travel across the interstate bridge to get into Portland. And it's a friggin' mess. Even if you take C-Tran line 105 to go from Vancouver into Portland that way, you're still stuck with the busy traffic on that bridge. So instead, I've created the Vancouver Shuttle, which takes the Amtrak route and go, the Amtrak Cascades route, and goes from Union Station in Portland and eventually over the Willamette River and over the Columbia River into Vancouver, Washington and serves that station. And that's it. Just two stops. And because it's sort of, it is outside of TriMet's boundaries, but it's not outside of C-Trans boundaries. In fact, it's right in it. And because this service would be a little bit different, I have numbered the zone as zone one and a half, which I know seems kind of weird but it's what made sense to me as it's in a different U.S. state. So it wouldn't make sense to keep it as Zone 1, so it's Zone 1 and a half. So now let me explain in a little more detail on the fare zones. Everything that TriMet already serves is within Zone 1, which would be a normal TriMet fare pricing. $2.50 for two and a half hours, or $5 for the whole day. And really, that's about all you're gonna need if you travel through the area within TriMet's boundaries. But as soon as you start to travel outside of those boundaries, it will start to get a little more expensive. We're gonna go into a pretty big deep dive here and very, very detailed, so buckle in. We're gonna assume that you're gonna use an adult fare with an adult pop card you would pay $2.50 for two and a half hours if you're gonna do just zone one. If you're gonna to travel to zone one and a half, add 50 cents to that. It will go $3 for two and a half hours or $5.50 for all day. Zone two would be another 50 cents on top of that. So it would be $3.50 for two and a half hours and $6 for the whole day. And if you travel to zone three, add another dollar onto that. So it would be $4.50 for two and a half hours or $7 for the whole day. Still a lot cheaper than driving that every single day and having to pay for gas every once in a while and maintaining your personal vehicle. So how would Hop know how far you traveled? If you tap on at the beginning of your journey, it has no idea how far you've traveled by the time you end your journey. Well, when it comes to traveling on regional rail, what you'll do is you'll tap on at the beginning of your trip, hop on the train, and when you exit the train, tap your card again. I would imagine there would be audio announcements every so often reminding you to tap your card again when you exit the train, and the conductor might get off of the train or there might be people at the station or whatever at each station standing near the hop reader saying remember to tap off, remember to tap as you exit um, just to get that rhythm going. Only these regional trains you would have to do that. Even if you're traveling only in zone one 
It's so that Hoth knows how much to charge you based on how far you travel. So even if you're only going to travel in one zone, still you must tap on and off. Now it's time to talk about rolling stock. Now you could go the way that many North American cities have gone and order the bi-level coaches. Unfortunately, Bombardier has stopped production of these because they are no longer a company and were bought out by Alstom. And I have no idea if Alstom still makes the bi-level coaches. I think they might, but it's a very old school design at this point. But if you're gonna go with a diesel train line, which I would recommend trying to avoid if at all possible because again diesel's not exactly great for the environment so if instead you want to get EMUs electric multiple units and electrify the train line I would highly highly recommend the Stadler KISS Caltrain in San Francisco from San Francisco to San Jose California the Caltrain is currently, as I speak, being electrified. They are using quite a few different types of trains, but are going to upgrade to these exact units. And I really like the way they look. They offer a very familiar design to the bi-level coaches, except they are electric. And they're multiple units. No locomotives are required at all. They are self-powered, which is really nice for just simpler, smoother operation. I should probably talk about low floor versus high floor. Now of course low floor or high floor usually means that the doors are at different heights. Low floor means the doors are lower and high floor means they're higher. That should be fairly obvious. But that does make a huge difference on a number of factors. Union Station in Portland, Oregon City Station, and Salem Station and Vancouver Station are all low floor. The platforms are very low to the ground. So having a low floor double deck train coach is very important. And that is what Alstom, the bi-level coaches, that's what those are, are low floors. Same deal with the Stadler Kiss. That is what's important here, to have a low floor double decker train and to not build high platforms like what we see on the west, which is yet another reason why I've separated it into where the west is one type of train service and then these regional trains would be another. That's a lot of words. And then, speaking of the west, the west would get upgraded to have better train cars than what we currently have. Hopefully getting some sort of hydrogen multiple unit if those exist or somehow electrifying the existing network and using electric multiple units. So now it's time to talk about the schedules and service hours for these lines. So let's talk about the West first. The Willamette line that goes from Beaverton Transit Center to Salem would run all day on weekdays and it would run every 30 minutes during the rush and every 60 minutes off-peak. The Tualatin Valley Line would be very much the same with 30 minute frequency during the rush and 60 minutes off-peak and none of these lines would run on weekends. That is if you build the Tualatin Valley Line at all. Now the regional rail trains leaving Union Station they may not have as good of a schedule just because of how busy the freight corridor is through here because there's freight and multiple Amtrak services running through this area. So you couldn't really get away with really high frequencies like having 30 minutes for example, but at least having hourly trains I think would be useful. And these train lines would run seven days a week. So now to get an even more deep dive into this, I have on here as of I believe the February 2022 schedule or maybe it is the September 2022 schedule or something. I have all of the train times at Union Station for Portland and whether or not they depart or arrive. And then below that I list the time throughout the hour that these trains would leave Union Station. So the Cherry City line would leave 30 minutes past the hour every hour. The Vancouver shuttle would leave 35 minutes past the hour every hour. 
and then the Astoria line would leave at the 05 times in each hour every two hours. And I would guess probably during summer times and during the summer months, there would be additional trips throughout the day. There would be more service during the summer than at any other time throughout the year. So when it comes to improving the existing west service that we have, what are the best ways of doing that? Well, firstly, it would be really great if service were brought back to the way it was pre-COVID, which is 30-minute frequency. The West used to run every 30 minutes. It currently, for the last two and a half years, has been running at 45-minute frequency. And the trains are starting to get back to normal ridership levels, sort of, and the trains are getting busier. So it would be nice to have that increased frequency so it just feels a bit more comfortable. Also, the trains should be longer. The existing platforms are long enough for two-car trains, but on a normal day, only one two-car train set actually runs. Between Beaverton Transit Center and Wilsonville on the existing alignment, only two trains operate. They operate back and forth, but it's just two individual train vehicles that are running. One of them is a two-car train set, the other one is a single car. And even during pre-COVID times, still only one of the train sets was a two-car train and the other two were single cars. That's not exactly good because if you look at it, it's like, oh look, here's this tiny little train. And then you easily forget about it because it's just really not all that interesting. If instead all the train cars were two cars long, it might stick in your head more that, oh wow, this looks kind of cool, maybe I should try it out. It looks like a pretty long train, let's try it. And maybe further down the road, or further down the trackway, you could extend all the platforms to maybe fit a three-car train. And regional rail would probably be big enough to have train cars that are five train car sets long, that are double-deck train cars. Depending on how ridership goes, you could have them between three and, heck, maybe six train cars. The Sounder train in Seattle typically runs five car train sets on the south line and two or three car train sets on the north line. But during some game days where there's a Seahawks game or whatever, or major event that's happening at T-Mobile Park or Lumen Field in Seattle, they will run seven car train sets on the south line and I think five car train sets on the north line. So the platforms should be built long enough to be able to include that even if when you first open it the train car sets are much shorter. Now lots of people wonder how to take transit to Salem and whether or not it's even possible to do from TriMet. The answer is yes it is currently possible but it requires going to Wilsonville and going on a separate transit agency, so that means paying two individual fares to get to Salem. It is convenient, but it's not very fast, and I don't think a lot of people know about it. Having regional train lines and a west line to be able to extend out to there at a bare minimum would help that whole confusion go away. If you could just look at a map and say, oh, we have a train that goes to Salem? I'm gonna take that. And then be done with it for the day and not have to ask anybody about anything at all. You literally just take the train to Salem and that's it. You don't really have to think about anything. That at a bare minimum, I believe, is what we should be doing. And what I think a lot of people believe we should be doing. I've heard multiple people's opinions about extending the west to Salem. The trackway literally already exists and the Kaiser Transit Center is right off the trackway. It was purposely designed that way for future train expansion. We really should be doing this. In fact, the mayor of Wilsonville even said in a recent meeting at the beginning of October and commented on this exact sort of thing about getting more west service out this way and extending it to Salem. Let's do this. We really need to. Now let's talk about electrification. I kind of sort of mentioned it, but let's go into a little bit more detail. Ideally, you would be able to electrify all of this, the regional rail lines, the west lines, and all of that sort of thing, 
which I sort of talked about in my recent video, literally just last week, on electric freight trains. Having a 25 kilovolt AC overhead catenary line on the whole thing, except in low clearance areas where you would switch to 12 and a half kilovolt AC, that I think would be perfect. But if that were not possible for one reason or another, even though Denver, Colorado has proven that it is possible, and Caltrain has also proven that it is possible, if for whatever reason you can't electrify this because other freight trains use it or whatever excuse those freight companies give you, then at least getting hydrogen locomotives at first to pull these trains or if they make hydrogen multiple units for use on the west, at least starting that way would be a great way of reducing emissions at first, but ideally you would be electrifying everything. Once again, if Denver or San Francisco or Toronto can electrify their regional rail trains, I think we can too. Well, hopefully we see some sort of regional rail travel come to the Portland area, as that could be very easily implemented, as well as improving the existing west system. Any improvement at all is big. So with that, I thank you for watching this, and I will see you Friday.